All right, we're going to get started. The microphones are loud now, as you can tell. Um, so if you can take your seats. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It sounds like the microphone is better. Uh, it was great to hear Dr. Matches teach. Um, I'm here to preach. Uh, I don't have a medical background. Uh, I'm not a public defender. I certainly don't have any religion that involves uh, not wishing nothing but safety for babies. But this debate, this fight, about shaking baby syndrome was handled very, very poorly in the court system. And it has tremendously negative consequences for those involved. There's a lot of blame. Um, much of my presentation will certainly imply blame lays with those involved in the field of child abuse pediatrics, who have made a lot of mistakes driven by ideology that they refuse to correct. There's a lot of other blame. Courts have decided this is a complicated area. And so courts have been rather, in my view, rather lazy, applying rules that apply. Jurors, you can make a pretty good argument, have routinely ignored what burdens of proof should apply in this, in this context. And a lot of defensive attorneys, really, perhaps for understandable reasons, in some circumstances, have not done their jobs. So this whole, whole area is a mess. But what is this area? We use the term shaken baby syndrome. We use the term abusive head trauma. What are we talking about? In its classic form, I think it's easiest to talk about shaken baby syndrome as consisting of two major tenets. One, that shaking is a common and particularly dangerous form of child abuse. One, shaking is common and a particularly dangerous form of child abuse. And that's why you see stuff like this. This is stuff put out by the National Center on Shaking Baby Syndrome, which is an advocacy group, a very influential one, one which most of the leading figures in child abuse pediatrics participate in and support. You see stuff like this, um, based on, again, this notion that shaking is a particularly dangerous and often lethal form of abuse. Look, an infant is more likely to die from all motor vehicle accidents Car crashes, poisoning, fire, electrocution, four to one more combined. You see stuff down at the bottom. A baby who is shaken is more likely to die than an individual who suffers from a gunshot wound. And a, for a nice touch, there's this bullseye behind it. I started to wonder if the NCSBS and the NRA shared board members or something like that. Um, but again, there, there's this belief, and it's certainly been around for decades now that shaking is a very common form of abuse and that it's very, very dangerous. The second major tenet, and in some ways the more controversial form of child, excuse me, the more controversial form of uh, debate um, uh, is not, again, this notion that we shouldn't be shaking babies. Almost every parent who's had a child in the last 20 years has received instructions on don't shake your baby. In fact, in many hospitals, you can't leave until you sign off that you've received instruction on it. But again, that's not where the debate is. Where the debate is, is on the second major tenet of shaking baby syndrome, which is that shaking leaves a fairly unique set of injuries. It leaves a relatively reliable forensic trail, such that when a baby has these injuries, you can infer that the baby was violently shaken or, or suffer some other serious form of what is sometimes called acceleration, deceleration trauma. That is where the legal system most, most commonly finds itself involved, is that second tenet, that shaking is a relatively reliable forensic trial. Now again, this debate has been around for, for decades, for at least for 20 years. There has been meaningful debate about shaken baby syndrome. It has not been a static debate. It has not been an even debate. But the debate goes back a couple of decades at this point in time. And so it seems rather unremarkable from a legal perspective. Most of you in here have legal training. From a legal perspective, 
if a forensic concept, whether it's medical or scientific, if a forensic concept is evolving, if it hasn't been adequately, valid, been adequately validated, then it shouldn't be used to convict people of child abuse or murder or to take their children away. Most people don't have a problem with that concept. And yet these prosecutions continue. And they're even more common, by the way, in family court than they are in criminal court. Now, I get about a call a week from lawyers who have these cases. Many times it's their first, it's their first case. And they buy into this concept, and they see that there's a controversy, and they think the case is very defensible. That's their first reaction is, wow, I might have a case as a public defender here that involves actual innocence that I might be able to win. And so they can figure out that there's a controversy pretty quickly. But then they start running into reality that these cases involve not just medicine generally, but all these distinct areas of medicine. Dr. Matt just talked to you about the eyes and the neurology, right? The forensic pathology. And there's all these views of child abuse pediatrics, and then the radiology, MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays. The complexity of this is enormous. This is the forensic pathologist who might know if I was a defense attorney, and I had a case involving ballistics or toxicology. You could probably sit down with me in a few hours and explain to me everything I needed to know in order to understand any debates that might apply to the case. But when it comes down to shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma, you can study it for months. It will overwhelm almost all public defenders who have a huge caseload that they're trying to deal with, let alone private attorneys don't have, who don't have colleagues and as many resources sometimes as even the public defender. For families that are looking into this, the internet research eventually will run you into paywalls, right, into terminology you don't understand. The complexity of this is huge. So how do these cases get decided? They're in front of judges who have a whole list of cases that day, right? They're in front of jurors who don't have any of that background. They get decided not based on the scientific substance of this debate. That's kind of fooling ourselves that we're going to go in there into a matter of the sheer weight of the science that this is going to get played out. It hasn't been able to be resolved in scientific communities or medical communities. How are you going to solve it in a three-day trial in some family court? You're not. It's decided on credibility. And those caretakers and parents who face criminal liability or face losing their children in those proceedings are at an incredible disadvantage in trying to fight this credibility battle. Incredible disadvantage. And on one side, you have organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics. You have doctors that come testify. And by the way, they testify in lots of these cases. They're quite good at it. They come from children's hospitals. Right? You have advocacy groups that, that for years have been putting out literature about the dangers of shaken baby syndrome, and institutionalizing this as if it's a well-established scientific construct. There's, they put out statements uh, from these organizations on, on the validity of the science and the medicine and the reliability of these concepts. These are obviously things that judges and experts and jurors look at and attribute great weight to. They have their own treatises, beautiful, beautifully done treatises, and they have completely co-opted prosecutors who, in my view, you as a group are not honoring their ethical responsibilities by just deciding that they're going to only pay attention to one side of the scientific dispute and put people in prison and take away their kids on a scientific dispute that hasn't been resolved. And they put out things like overcoming defense expert testimony in abusive head trauma cases. And as any doctors who have ever testified in these cases regularly can tell you, there's a whole book out there on them. Everywhere they go, they face challenges to their credibility because it is understood by those who believe in shaken baby syndrome that they can win this credibility battle. And so they fight it on credibility terms. So with this institutional, uh, institutional disparity, coupled with things like Dr. Match just mentioned, the institution, excuse me, the biases that come from there's a dead baby or an injured baby or a sick baby, people want an explanation. 
and all the other biases that infect our system and imbalances, these are incredibly challenging cases. This credibility challenge is really, and I don't know what percentage, but in a very high percentage of cases, it dooms. It dooms the effort from the outset, despite the impassioned efforts of uh, criminal defense attorneys and family law attorneys and families doing everything they can to figure out a way to tell their story. The police involvement only makes it worse because the police believe what they've been told by the hospitals. And so that's biases that Dr. Mattis mentioned. They start to set in too. Parents are told something must have happened to this child. Something must have happened to this child. So parents start guessing, well, four days ago, the baby fell when it was with that. And next thing you know, the debate is about whether this fall four days ago is what caused the child to have a seizure four days later. Of course, that's not a debate that really has any connection to what happened. So enough negativity. So I thought that the number one message I wanted to convey today is, is to the lawyers. You have to be the most important expert in these cases. You have to be the most important expert in these cases. Most of the lawyers that start out enthusiastic about these cases call me, and what they really want is the name of medical experts, because it's difficult to find medical experts who want to test on these cases. They want me to give them the names. And then they largely feel after they've retained those experts that their job, at least for quite a while, is done. They're hoping the medical experts will give them a way forward in these cases. And if that is the route you take, it generally does not work. You have to be able to conduct a cross-examination of the experts in these cases, largely without the help of your expert. If you can't get to that stage, you won't win. You have to be able to challenge your expert in areas where your expert may still be influenced by their medical training from years ago or may not be familiar with the existing literature. You have to be able to challenge your experts. And you have to put together a case, a case that can help balance out this credibility. You have to find a way to inject your credibility into these cases, your credibility into these cases, or the credibility imbalance will doom your <coughs> And that starts early. In these cases, judges have to be educated well in advance of trial. There's various excuses you can make. I once asked for a motion. I once filed a motion to have an expert appear by telephone. And it was six pages long because I went on about some one of the legal issues for six pages in that motion to appear by telephone because you have to find creative ways to start educating your judge about the actual controversy that you're going to be presenting. You have to start early. You have to be thoughtful about it. But you have to educate. And you're going to have to find a way to present this to the jury in a way that is accessible to the jury, that enlists the jury in this controversy in a matter that is not just a battle of the experts. Because if it's just a battle of the experts, I already explained to you, it doesn't matter if your expert is Jan Oppoven or Carl Weiger or Evan Matches, people who understand this better than the people on the other side. They're probably gonna lose, no offense to any of you. Uh, they're probably gonna lose because of that credibility imbalance. You're gonna have to set the table different. Well, how's that supposed to be done, Randy? That's a nice set of platitudes. So, a few years ago, I had a shaken baby case. It was a post-conviction relief case. This was in 2012. I had helped with one in several years, and I was really pleased by how much new literature and new understanding had come out in the preceding several years. I had first handled one of these cases, uh, started working on one in 1998. That case, uh, we eventually, uh, client had been already previously sentenced and lost all his direct appeals uh, to 35 years. We eventually got habeas relief on that case. That case went to trial in 2007, so nine years later. One of our experts on that case was Dr. Uphoven. I'm forever grateful for people like Dr. Uphoven, and I can name them on my fingers, who have been helping with these cases all these years, because back then there really was nobody. There was hardly any literature. That was helpful, there was very few doctors. But by 2012, there was a lot more out there. We're gonna talk about, there's a lot more out there. And we won another post-conviction relief case. And I started getting calls from lots of lawyers about what did you do to win? Because we keep losing. 
And I kept hearing from other, other people out that I would follow up, I'd give them all the information, and they kept losing. And I eventually concluded this credibility battle in the average case was simply to log the push. So I started writing specifically to explore and to ultimately to provide some understanding that I think can be used to help even out that credibility battle. And that led uh, to the book, to a book that I wrote uh, that was published just this last year. Uh, there's a copy here with Dr. Huffo that you can pass around if any of you haven't seen it. And the intent of the book was to provide tools to uh, criminal defense attorneys, to judges, to doctors who have an interest in the area, so that you can participate on the level that I'm talking about is necessary to prevail on these cases. Because if, if you do get on top of this stuff, and you are adequately prepared to cross-examine the state's experts, the science and the medicine do not favor convictions in many of these cases. But it takes a lot of work. It took years. It took me after handling many of these cases. It took the better part of four years to produce the book. The idea is to save you a lot of time. I, I can't. So, in fighting the credibility battle, one thing that you have to internalize and find a way to tell is there's a story. There is an absolute story. There is an art to the shaking baby debate that is actually quite compelling. It's very difficult just to stand up an opening statement maybe and, and tell, but you can get it out during the course of a trial. You can use your experts on particular issues to tell, but you have to know there's a lot of power. You have to know this story well. And there are aspects of the story that in particular cases are more applicable than others, but I think uh, knowing this story certainly will empower you to know you're on the right track. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking, what is the story? What is the debate about? And it starts off like a lot of things that go awry. It starts off with good intentions. This is a, a picture of, of a book of Dr. Henry Kemp, Denver pediatrician. Uh, he obviously loved this picture. It's used at the Kemp Center. It's on this book. You see versions of this exact picture and a lot of things associated with his legacy. In the 1960s, early 1960s, there was almost nothing done protect children from child abuse. Things that you take for granted today, child protective services, didn't exist in many jurisdictions or barely existed. There was no such thing as the mandatory reporting laws that every state now, now has. The concept of a child abuse pediatrician didn't exist. Funding for these things was uh, absent almost everywhere. Child abuse was considered a family problem and for the most part, not a medical problem. Problem. Doctors would treat kids if they suspected were abused, but they didn't view it as their job. They might call police, they might call social services occasionally in extreme cases. But child abuse was a greatly under-recognized and certainly under-appreciated problem. And Dr. Henry Kemp sought to do something about that. And he wrote an article in 1962 that is not especially medical, but it is listed as one of the most influential medical articles of all time. There's actually rankings of such things, and this is on the list. The Battered Child Syndrome, published in 1962 by Dr. Kemp, some other heavyweights, changed the landscape. It changed the landscape. The general gist can be broken down into these three principles. One, doctors should play a key role in identifying and reporting. Doctors should play a key role in identifying and reporting. Two, doctors should guarantee that no further abuse will occur. And I pulled out that word guarantee because that's actually in the abstract. And it's important for what we're going to talk about later. That reflects a, I'm using the word bias, not in a bad sense, but a bias needs to be applied by doctors for protecting children. And third, to identify abuse, doctors should compare the history given as to why the child was injured against the child's actual in injuries, kind of a common sense approach. Now, of course, this requires understanding what histories may lead to which findings. And it's obvious that he was assuming that certain things that he was talking about were, in fact, injuries in the sense that most of us think about traumatically inflicted injuries. So there's a battered child in 1962. 
Now, after the battered child, everything changed. Within five years, every state had mandatory reporting statutes. Pediatricians led the way to make sure those statutes got put in place. There was almost no literature in the medical profession that existed regarding child abuse before camp in 1962. It exploded after that. And doctors were everywhere trying to figure out which injuries are more likely to be caused by abuse than others. And there was a very, uh, very influential pediatric neurosurgeon in England named Guth Couch. He was the first pediatric neurosurgeon, in fact, in England. And he sought to explain some cases that you sometimes saw where a child would report with subdural hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, so blood in the subdural space around outside the brain, but wouldn't have any impact injuries to the head, wouldn't have a skull fracture, wouldn't have bruising on the head. And based on some histories he got from some parents and his own hypothesizing, he said, hey, be aware, shaking, shaking an infant may cause subdural hemorrhage. He put up that word 1971, and that is in some ways considered the origin of the shaken baby syndrome. 1972, there was a doc, doctor named Kathy, and Kathy had really been a pioneer in this stuff. He was writing about suspicious injuries in children even before Kemp. And reading between the lines, it seems kind of clear that Kathy was not totally happy with the attention and credit that Kemp had been given for some of this uh, stuff. He proposed renaming the battered child syndrome as the Kathy Kemp syndrome. He didn't agree with some of the things that, um, that Kemp had said. But when he saw Gus Kelch's piece on shaking, he really seemed to have an aha moment. He wrote three papers in the course of a few years about the dangers of shaking. And he was a pretty prominent individual. So he really sounded the alarm as shaking, which he said is a leading cause of retardation and death in these, uh, and intracranial injury in these cases. And he introduced a new idea. It was almost kind of a, a, a throwaway is too strong a term, but almost a throwaway line. Some physicians by this point in time had observed that a lot of abused children had retinal hemorrhages. They didn't always call them retinal hemorrhages. Sometimes they call them retinal lesions. It was just an observation that a lot of abused kids had this. And, and Kathy threw in the idea that shaking would explain these retinal injuries. The traction stresses is what he ca called them between different parts of the eye during violent shaking could cause these retinal hemorrhages. So he kind of really gave some popularity to the idea that shaking causes retinal hemorrhages. This goes back in the early 70s. Now he, Kathy was all about prevention. He was not about criminal prosecution. He was not about calling people child abuse, uh, accusing them of child abuse. K Kathy actually hypothesized that you wouldn't have to shake a child very hard to cause these injuries. In fact, he said they generally consider them innocuous. Shaking was not necessarily uh, thought of as having to be violent in order to have these kinds of intracranial effects. And this lasted, this belief that the shaking that would be necessary to cause these injuries lasted for quite some time. This is a quote from a 1981 book put out by the American Bar Association for judges who were just starting to deal with child abuse cases in any volume. This is the early 1980s. And they had a definition of what at the time was the whiplash shaking infant syndrome. And again, Still, shaking can be caused by relative, excuse me, these injuries can be caused by relatively innocuous and seemingly harmless effects. That was into the 80s. The, the people that were involved by then in researching and advocating on child abuse issues is this subject uh, within the medical profession of child abuse pediatrics really had become a thing by the late 80s, early 90s. They were very frustrated that the public and the medical profession and the courts were not taking shaking seriously enough. There were, there were articles about it, that shaking is a form of abuse, that shaking is causing lots of injuries and deaths, and that for whatever reason they wrote, the public does not seem to care about shaking like they care about other forms of child. 
and they started redefining, redefining this sort of shaken infant concept as something that required more force. And this is what they said. When you have these injuries, you could, they would support a medical presumption of child abuse. Any intracranial injury. So any subdural hemorrhage would support a medical presumption of child abuse. Now, those of you in the legal field who were all taught to really focus on burdens of proof, particularly in criminal cases, guilt must be reliably proven. Everybody's entitled to presumption of innocence. That's not what the medical profession was being taught. They were being taught if you had any intracranial injury in a child under one, that is a presumption of child abuse. This comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is what was taught in schools. This is what was taught to social workers. Yeah. So is this a what they consider conclusive presumption or a presumption that calls for further investigation? What does it mean to them? Guilty until proven otherwise. Let's talk about whether you, how easy it was to prove otherwise. This is what they were taught. Retinal hemorrhage plus subdural hemorrhage equals shaking baby syndrome. Still, though, relatively few prosecutions because the public was not necessarily accepting of the idea, and a lot of prosecutors weren't accepting of the idea that you needed, you know, if it can happen from seemingly innocuous shakings, how are we going to prosecute people? Courts. Again, courts express their view almost by definition. Infant shake syndrome lacks the intent for the crime of murder. This is as late as 1984. And this is where the advocacy element of child abuse pediatrics began to distort, in my view, began to distort the science in order to reach a result they thought was good for child protection. They started arguing that SBS required extreme levels of force extreme levels of force. The same American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement, the act of shaking leading to shaking baby syndrome is so violent that individuals observing it would recognize it as dangerous and likely to kill the child. Again, those of you with legal training, that's sort of classic mens rea terminology put into guidance for pediatricians, put into guidance for people that worked at children's hospitals. There was no science that supported this. And again, the initial hypothesis was that even innocuous shakings could lead to these, could, could lead to these uh, findings. There was no science to support this. Nothing happened between the late 80s and when this stuff started coming out in the early 90s. It came out this way because in order to aid criminal prosecutions, you can trace it, in order to aid criminal prosecutions, you had to attribute to the parents some form of violence, violent intent, violent conduct, in order to justify the type of charges that started to be brought. And this was no accident. This was 2001, this particular statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It flowed directly out the door, right over to the prosecutors. So this was a book put out in 2001. You see, it refers to shaken baby syndrome, a multidisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary. And by then, multidisciplinary had come to mean not only different disciplines of healthcare providers, but also judges and prosecutors, police, social workers. They all were involved. And this is by this point in time, prosecutors had really been co opted into this notion that they were all part of a team, essentially, with these child abuse pediatricians. And so, the same year as the AAP came out, prosecutors started advising that it took violent trauma. You could infer violence from these, from, these, uh, from these findings. That you couldn't do it really without doing something so violent that anyone would recognize it as likely to kill the child. Wasn't, uh, this became ubiquitous. This is from the Department of Justice, which put out guides uh, for prosecuting and investigating shaken baby cases. This one's from 2002. It talked about retinal hemorrhages being conclusive evidence of shaken baby syndrome. But again, consistent with the notion that it requires extreme force to cause these shaken baby findings, they said it would be conclusive evidence unless you had something like a severe auto accident or a fall from multiple stories. That's the equivalent type of force that you would get other than from shaken baby. 
syndrome. So shaken baby syndrome on the one hand, falling out a window on the other. So things like a fall didn't involve enough force. If a parent came in, so the child fell off, fell off a, a couch or a counter or had some other household type of accident, no, that doesn't involve enough force. It's either shaking or if you have some explanation like an unrestrained auto accident. So again, there's this, this notion embedded in medicine and among prosecutors that shaken baby syndrome injuries reflect extreme force. Um, there was always a notion of sort of biomechanics. Always a notion of biomechanics. Now, I don't know if any of you know what biomechanical engineering is or injury biomechanics are, but there are scientists out there who are not necessarily MDs, usually are not MDs, who study the force, the, the effects of force on the human body. They do their best work in the auto industry, right? Car crash dummy testing is done by injury biomechanics experts. Nashley uses injury biomechanics experts. They're who design motorcycle helmets and what sort of material should be beneath playgrounds. They're the experts on what sort of forces will, will cause what sort of injuries to the human body. But the doctors, involved in child abuse pediatrics routinely use biomechanical concepts to explain how it is that shaking caused these kinds of injuries. Uh, things like G-forces and acceleration, deceleration. Um, so then we get to 1997. And 1997 really was the first time any of the shaking baby stuff had been meaningfully challenged. Really the first time, and it was quite a thing for those of us who were already paying attention to uh, these types of things. It was Court TV, if you can remember Court TV, their all-time biggest thing, at least until the OJ trial. Uh, no, I think their all-time biggest viewership was the nanny case. The nanny case, the au pair nanny case from Boston. And Louise Woodard was a young woman who came from England to serve as an au pair for a, eventually for a family in the Boston area. Uh, both parents, I believe, were physicians, um, and a baby that she, one of the babies that she was watching, uh, ended up uh, dying. Died at Boston, Boston Children's Hospital, just connected to Harvard. And that baby had a, a cracked skull, a skull that had been cracked at least I think a couple of weeks earlier. Had other injuries and was quickly diagnosed as an abusive head trauma, shaken baby syndrome. The au pair agency had a vested interest in defending her, and so hired excellent lawyers who in turn hired excellent experts, and there was a first real battle, first real testing of shaken baby syndrome. The lawyer for Ms. Woodard was Barry Sheck, who later went on to even greater fame with the Innocence Network. Um, among his experts, were biomechanics experts, neurosurgery experts, some of the leading names in this area, certainly after this point in time became leading, leading names in this area. And this was fought out, fought out in the courtroom and played out in drama every day. It was really, in my experience, given my age, it was one of the first times I really realized how stupid people can be about things because much of the coverage was devoted to whether the baby's mom somehow was partially responsible for this because she worked out outside the home and left her child in a vulnerable position and whether she should have picked up warning signs. Other people debated vigorously whether the young woman seemed trustworthy or not. The actual science of it was largely washed out, at least in most people's view. But something very weird happened after that, that she was convicted under Massachusetts law at the time. She was sentenced to life in prison, and I think she was 20 years old or something. She got an automatic sentence of life. But the defense filed post-trial motions that argued that the science was not sufficient to convict her of shaking baby syndrome, excuse me, to convict her on the crime charge. And the judge, in a very thoughtful order, concluded that she might have done something wrong, but he didn't buy that, he, that she had been treated in the way necessarily that the prosecution was alleging. And he reduced her crime and sentenced her to time served, which I think was 279 days, and released her from life imprisonment to 279 days. And she was released. And those that had been advocating the shaken baby syndrome theories and pushing so hard 
to get the public, the medical profession, and the prosecutors to start taking these types of crimes to be violent trauma worthy of murder convictions, they lost their collective minds. <coughs> they then started revising the diagnosis again in order to make it very forensically specific. Right in response to this, uh, right in response to the Woodward outcome, they collectively, a hundred of them, got together and wrote a letter that was published in major newspapers around the country describing what we knew supposedly about shaken baby syndrome. And they started putting out a lot more literature that was very forensically specific that we could be, we could know that children with these findings had been abused and had been violently abused. This was the leading child abuse treatise at the time, it has major names at the bottom of that uh, as editors. Uh, and this is what it talked about. SBS usually produces a diagnostic triad of injuries. It lists three, diffuse brain swelling, the diffuse brain swelling categories, excuse me, elements, sometimes it's called different things, sometimes it's called cerebral edema, Dr. Match is referred to it as anoxic encephalopathy, sometimes it's just called encephalopathy, uh, but brain swelling is, is sort of the layman's gist of it. Brain swelling, subdural hemorrhage, and red hemorrhage. This triad must be considered virtually pathognomonic of SBS in the absence of documented extraordinary blood force such as an automobile accident. Okay? By the way, the, the, the term that I struggle saying really means it's distinctly characteristic of. So when you find these injuries, they're distinctly characteristic of shaking babies. This was what was in the treatise. Yeah, the major, the major uh, treatise on shaken baby syndrome at the time, the big text on shaken baby syndrome, the prosecutors. This was prosecutorial understanding at the time. The expert who acknowledges the classic findings of SBS includes some general hematoma, retinal hemorrhage, and edema, which means swelling, at least in this context, but chooses to ignore this constellation of findings in favor of an alternative hypothesis will appear. And doctors who suggested that anything other than SBS would explain this at the time, they were told they were quacks and that they were foolish. But SBS had morphed to the point where this constellation of findings was given for rent, very specific forensic <coughs> treatment. So almost the entire medical profession accepted that. Almost the entire minute, and I'm talking forensic pathologists, I'm talking about certainly in pediatrics, emergency medicine. So the only real defense that was left to defense lawyers, a lot of these cases, was, well, someone may have shaken this kid, but I didn't. You know, maybe it was over at the mom's house the day before. We had a babysitter three nights before. It was whether or not there could be a lucid interval where the, between the time that the baby had been abused and when the baby may have shown symptoms that let the baby go into the hospital, whether it was a seizure, seizure or just a complete collapse. Lucid interval became the defense, and it was successful in a few defenses. By 2001, they sought to close the door. This was a paper put out by the an ad hoc committee of the National Association of Medical Examiners in 2001. Some influential names on it. And they explain studies in children with non-accidental head injuries also indicate that they show an immediate decrease in their level of consciousness of head injury. There was very little support for that notion outside of car crash cases. And certainly in the car crash cases, they were simply describing that most of the kids that felt symptoms started to experience them right away. They weren't for forensic. Purposes. But this was put out as scientifically reliable dogma in the form of a committee statement from a major respected organization that children won't have a lucid interval. So let's look at what you had added up. You had, you could infer from these findings that it was extreme force had been used. Violent trauma was the guidance. You could take from them that this constellation was virtually unique to shaken baby syndrome. And you could generally rule out a lucid interval, certainly at least in moderate and serious cases, you could rub across. There was nothing left to even have a trial about by the time this was done. There was nothing left to barely have a trial about. 
Uh, a professor named Deborah Turkheimer, who I'll mention in a moment again, she called this, it had become a medical diagnosis of murder. A diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome essentially amounted to a medical diagnosis of murder. Not all the cases involved fatality, but it certainly has become a medical <coughs> diagnosis of child abuse. It provided the mens rea, the actus rea, and the whodunit, whoever was with the baby, when it showed the symptoms are collapsed. And a lot of people started to get convicted. A lot of people. Starting in the late 90s, starting in the 90s, but certainly by 2001, it started to roll. Prosecutors were trained on this. Lots of money. There's lots of money for child abuse prevention as there should, should be. There's lots of money in child abuse pediatrics. There's lots of money in prosecuting child abusers. And they started putting out all kinds of programs to get more people prosecuted who they believed were engaged in this sort of shaken baby conduct. So the challenges then began. Now, it's ironic that the peak of shaken baby was really about 2001 because that year the American Academy of Pediatrics put out there, put out a statement that year, and it was really reached sort of peak level in 2001. And in retrospect, 2001 is one of the challenges also really began. It's sometimes described as a bit of a fulcrum in the debate. What was the first challenge? So the first challenge, in my view, other than the Woodward trial, came in the aftermath of the Woodward trial. When the 100 doctors stood up and wrote that letter and said, you know, the judge had lost his mind. You know, he clearly didn't understand how well accepted the science is in this area. One Minnesota pathologist wrote a letter in response that he thought that those doctors, he didn't know what those doctors were talking about. They had it wrong. He had two great quotes on there that, in retrospect, were really, really insightful. The bottom one is, if the law has made you a witness, remain a man of science. You have no victim to avenge, no guilty or innocent person to render saying You must bear witness within the limits of science. The second quote that he has on there, the problem isn't what we don't know, the problem is what we do know that isn't so. Well, attributed to Will Rogers. Um, I think that in some ways summarizes the problem with what we have is people thought they have understood stuff for a long time. As it turns out, they didn't know because they didn't, because they thought they knew, they thought they knew these things. We stopped looking for alternate explanations for many years, right? We stopped really doing science except to prove what we thought we already knew. And I do think it's funny Dr. Plunkett passed away last year. Um, I later told him that he not only got it wrong, Will Rogers didn't really say it, but what is attributed to Will Rogers, he, he, he misquoted it. But this, all the brilliant people of, of our century, Mark Twain, Richard Feynman, Stephen Hawkins, they all say the same thing. And I think this is just really goes to the core of what the problem is here. People are insisting they know things that they don't know, and in some ways is more problematic than just admitting we don't know. So Plunkett really came up with the first, the first real element to the challenge. He started studying childhood falls and the dangers of childhood falls. It had become shaken baby syndrome dogma that a short fall, accidental fall, what we think of as a short fall, could not lead to the shaken baby syndrome findings. That was in the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance report. That's what was testified in courtrooms all the time. A lot of people were convicted based on that. I know Dr. Weiger has a case involving a woman who was convicted based on categorical testimony that you couldn't get this in the short form. That was categorical, and he challenged that. And the first challenge came in. Well, so show me how you do your center salt. Let me hold your glasses. Okay, let me hold your hand. I'm afraid to hit the pause button. I'm not sure we can do this, so I'll come back. Okay. Do your somersault on your toy. Your somersault over there, honey. Oh, I didn't see that. Your quarter. Okay. Let me hold your hand. This is Grandma filming her niece and nephew. The carpet covered garage. You're a good landing. Are you all right? Oh, tell Daddy love you. He gets wrong. Doggone it. Yeah. He's been doing it for me all day with no trouble. Now he's. Yeah. 
kind of like his grandma. Be careful, Jacqueline. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Go ahead. There's your glasses. Look at her. Look at her. Hi. Here you go. Don't climb on that. Okay. Okay. Be careful. Tell me, hang on, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. So, um, I know it's so, somewhat disturbing to watch, but after Dr. Matches go, I always say, uh, <laughs> the, the, the child there that, that, that fell later passed away. She was 23 months old, so she wasn't an infant. She was 23 months old. At the hospital, um, she cried a little bit. She drank some water before she did. That was Plunkett. That was case number five in the Plunkett study that I, I put up. He put up a case of uh, um, a series of childhood deaths. Most of the children were, all the children, I believe, were from 13 months up to 18, who had, had falls, verified falls, um, and had died. Uh, this was the most compelling example because there was a videotape. And in fact, because there was a videotape, neither grandma or the parents were prosecuted. Because the people at the hospital, they observed that the child had the triad, did not believe that this could have happened the way it had been described. So they said to the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was skepticism about if this could have happened anyway, other than through some form of child abuse. But that started to really, over time, it didn't happen overnight, but that series from Plunkett and that video studied up uh, and written about separately, really started to open the door that, wow, childhood falls can cause serious intracranial injury. And it forced people to go back. And there was actually quite a bit of literature that predated the shaken baby syndrome part about the dangers of childhood falls. In fact, Kathy had talked about the likelihood of, of uh, getting a childhood fall, of childhood fall causing syndrome human fall. So that was the first real challenge that came from Plunkett uh, regarding the Falls. There's been other videos uh, and witnessed uh, short falls that have led to, uh, led to, led to we've probably seen enough of for cool in the afternoon. Um, the next challenges came from the biomechanics, the biomechanical experts. This goes back to the shaken baby text from 2001, where a prosecutor is giving guidance for experts testifying for the state in shaken baby case. So the expert can testify that the forces the child experiences are the equivalent of a 50 to 60 mile an hour unrestrained motor vehicle accident or a fall from three to four stories on a surface. Another explanation relates to gravitational or G-forces minimally necessary to produce some of these injuries greater than 10 years. There was no scientific basis for any of that. Any of that. The notion that shaking caused those kinds of forces, the only biomechanical testing that had been done, refuted that. But this is what doctors were going around testifying. Doctors were going around testifying about what you could infer from a child's life. So biomechanics started testing. There's been a series of biomechanical studies, uh, probably a half a dozen. Almost all of them are very similar results. And shaking is that blue line at the bottom. You, you can't shake live children to do this, but you can shake um, equipped dummies and you can actually get a pretty good reading of the forces involved, right? You can get a, if you're measuring G forces, biomechanical forces, there's lots of ways to do that. And shaking produces low, relatively low G forces. Certainly, if you had shaking done by a a 110-pound woman of a two-year-old child. In some of these cases, there was relatively small uh, caretakers accused of shaking a child that could only hold up for a handful of seconds uh, with their arms out, let alone shake violently for a long time. It simply didn't work. Shaking produces relatively low, low uh, accelerations. Falling, by contrast, produces much greater acceleration. Even falls from 18, 24, 36 inches can produce much greater acceleration. Now, children don't always land directly on their heads, and sometimes their surfaces that play a role. 
but in terms of actually measuring the biomechanical forces, the biomechanical challenges started to become rather impactful. There's lots of stuff that's out there for defending these cases on the biomechanical forces, both of shaking and of short falls. This is from the least from a treatise. Chuck put together by a biomechanics named uh, Chris Van e. um, Some of the stuff is pretty well done. You can get there's some good biomechanical stuff in one of the Washington Post articles you can still pull up online. But as you can see, shaking simply doesn't equate to almost any of these events that it was considered to be either equivalent or greater. greater. So then the, the, the next group of shakes, so you had the biomechanical stuff, you had the fall stuff. Well, people started looking at these assumptions about why you could infer shaking from the findings. The three main findings, again, were some thorough hematoma, brain swelling, and retinal hemorrhaging. And those involved in child abuse pediatrics had come up with explanations for why those findings, individually and in combination, were so powerful. Retinal hemorrhaging was because the forces the eye sustains during a shaking episode cause the vitreous and the retina to shear and pull against each other, and that's why you would see broken blood vessels and bleeding, the vitreal retinal traction theory. So when you saw those, saw those retinal hemorrhages, that would imply that there had been repetitive shaking forces. And brain swelling was thought that the brain swelling re reflected torn or ripped axons on the surface of the brain. You were shaking the child so badly that brain tissue was beginning to, in microscopic ways, begin to rip apart and, and lead to the brain swell. And so dural hematoma, again, was these bridging veins that come out of the brain through the arachnoid into the dura, that they would, the brain would move, and the movement would torque and twist and rip these bridging veins, leading to leak into uh, and hemorrhage of blood into that subdural space. So when you saw each of these things in time, individually, they all indicated significant trauma. When you saw them all together, it was an overwhelming proof of trauma. Any natural disease might explain one of them on rare occasions, but when you saw all three of them, that meant shaken baby syndrome. Well, people started looking at these sort of explanations, these assumptions, and all of them broke down. This was a chart, I've tried to reduce it to one chart. Uh, I know I failed, you don't need to tell me I'm break, but as it turns out in some cases, subdural hemorrhage is not coming from torn bridging veins, it appears to be coming from oozing within the dura. A lot of these cases they would find that the hemorrhage was very thin, it wasn't thick like a big pool of hematoma blood that you would see in more traumatic incidents. It was thin and it was relatively diffuse, and that's because it's coming from dural oozing. What are the causes of dural oozing? The full list people don't know, but it certainly doesn't have to be traced to trauma in any way, let alone significant trauma. Brain swelling. They started looking more carefully at the brains, and they didn't show ripped axons. What they showed was damage that appeared to be caused by hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Now, in some cases, you might not be able to tell what caused this brain swelling, but it was consistent with lack of oxygen, which almost all these kids had a history of a lack of oxygen. And the retinal hemorrhages, instead of needing to resort to vitreous traction, there started to be increasing proof that the retinal hemorrhages are explainable by spikes or decreases in intracranial pressure or anything that would cause the clotting of these little tiny blood vessels and veins within, within the eye. So every one of these assumptions started to become a challenge, and every start, one of the assumptions started to fail. So people said, how did this happen? How did we get to this point where we got 1,000 people in jail, we stripped uh, kids from all these parents based on these assumptions, wasn't there proof for all of this? And so they started looking, what was the evidence based on these beliefs? And they would find that a littlest bit of evidence would be extrapolated to these wide conclusions. And by the way, then taken from the medical text and brought over to the prosecutor's office. But people were overstepping the conclusions of the data that they had, in many cases, the data didn't even barely exist to start with. They saw a routine problem with the studies that were out there. Doctors had been prematurely taught that the triad equals SPS. So when the child reported with the triad, unless the kid had a history of being involved in a motor vehicle accident, they would be diagnosed as SPS. The statistics would then show that the triad equals SBS, 
Major medical organizations look at these statistics, find them compelling, and make sure that doctors continue to be to be uh, continue to be taught to try. And this circularity, almost all these studies reflected this circularity. It's hard to believe that this mistake could have been made over and over, but it appears, appears to have been the case. And again, only reinforced by the fact that that's what new doctors were trained. And as they got more and more convictions, that in turn perpetuated its own circularity. So the circularity in the evidence base started to become widely recognized. This was not done until 2016, but this is a report that came out of Sweden that has its own sort of uh, unique history, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But this was the first deep dive into the evidence base for shaking baby syndrome, the triads relationship to shaking baby syndrome. And they found that out of these over a thousand articles that pertain to the subject, only 30 really purported to provide real evidence that met any sort of quality. 28 of the 30 were of low study quality and two were of water study. It's a matter of objective fact that the evidence base for shaken baby syndrome, judged against almost any standard, is very weak. Very, very weak. And yet we are routinely using it not merely for some you know, medical things, but we're routinely using it for things that are supposed to have some of the highest burden. There's a complete disconnect between the quality of the evidence base and how we treat it as evidence in the courtroom. So then people start to say, well, if it's not shaking, what is it? A lot of these alternatives had not been seriously investigated in many years. Um, but people started doing additional research into these, um, into, into these alternatives, including looking outside the child abuse literature and found out what specialists were actually finding in their own practices. And the list is controversial and growing and uncertain, but every day it seems like new stuff comes out on these topics. Falls certainly quickly made the list after Plunkett, and it's more and more recognized about the dangers of short falls. Um, there's lots of stuff now out there in falls. Uh, there's a diagnosis that must have a half dozen different names. Uh, I'll use Atkins, B-E-C-C, B-E-S-S, B-E-E-S, external hydrocephalus, most common in kids up to about maybe six, seven months old, more often boys. Um, it leads to the, it leads to a buildup of fluid, uh, which in turn can lead to uh, more easily the child getting intracranial pressure, uh, expanded head, and has an increased vulnerability to severe bleeding. It's a well known, it's a well known condition, uh, and it seems to be more than occasionally, more than occasionally confused for. Baby. Venous thrombosis is a form of stroke. It's actually more common early in life, late in life. Very controversial area, but a lot of these kids have uh, a lot of these kids have uh, indicia of venous thrombosis. Increasingly, there's an understanding that some of the subdural hemorrhage may have happened since birth. A lot of babies are born with subdural hemorrhage. By the way, a lot of babies are born with retinal hemorrhage too. They typically resolve. We wouldn't all be sitting here, but what percentage of cases do they not resolve? What is the various clinical courses? That's increasingly something that's studied and looked at as an explanation for a lot of these cases. Hypoxic events. Even Dr. Matches' theory that he was talking to you all about, about what if shaking causes damage to nerve roots that affects breathing. Well, what would explain the subdural hemorrhage in those cases? It would probably have to be some form of a cascade traceable to hypoxia. In those cases, there's a lot of cases. Hypoxia just means the child stops breathing. It's a lot of different circumstances, of course, in which a child may stop breathing but not die right away, choking, all kinds of other other incidents. There's a real fascinating thing that many of these alternatives are about two thirds to one third affecting boys more than boys more than girls. And yet, if you look at the shaking baby syndrome statistic, it's almost the exact same. Almost the exact same. The shaking baby proponents have tried to explain this by saying uh, people have unreasonable expectations for little boys and therefore may abuse them in this fashion. A lot of other statistics regarding child abuse are not the same statistical 
So there's a lot of reasons to believe that these other diagnoses, this is just a partial list, are lead, lead, lead to a certain amount of false shaken baby syndrome. So by 2009, the following category, so by 2009, these various challenges had really started to um, collapse the triad. Dr. Uh, Professor Turkheimer wrote an article in 2009 that got a lot of attention. It was very intellectual, very well done. Um, and it became increasingly difficult to defend shaken baby syndrome. And the triad, certainly difficult to, to uh, defend it as reliable enough proof to be used from courtrooms. They were starting to get results uh, in cases that were different than what they had been getting. The first post-conviction relief case that recognized that there had been changes in the shaken baby syndrome science was 2008. In 2009, the AAP was due to put out an update to their uh, reports on shaken baby syndrome. They'd done one in 93, 2001. These reports are good for eight years. So in 2009, people were really looking forward to what was going to be said. By then, Dr. Guthkelch, who had come out with the uh, first uh, hypothesis about shaken baby syndrome. By, 2000, uh, by 2012, he had, uh, he had, to some extent, disavowed how his work had been used. But what happened as, as, this, as this sort of buildup of attack on shaken baby syndrome that led to this? They changed the name. So the big, long-awaited 2009 report finally came out, and now it was abuse of head trauma in infants and children. And they explained that legal challenges to the term shaken baby syndrome can distract from the more important questions of accountability of the perpetrator and or the safety of the victim. Of course, the challenges were not to the term shaken baby syndrome. And the ultimate question is whether there's a perpetrator or victim. But that was seen as part of the solution, was to change the name, that that would somehow help clear this up. Uh, then they began saying that the diagnosis was of abuse rather than shaking. Before it was, remember, all these things were so forensically useful because you could infer shaking from them. You could infer, infer violent, repetitive conduct. But now it wasn't shaking anymore. It became abuse. So this is from October 2017. Uh, this was a response to that Swedish report I mentioned. This is from some very influential, uh, very influential people that are signed on to this, including if you look at the bottom, Society for Pediatric Radiology. Um, it's not just radiologists. It includes, for example, Joel Moreno is a law professor who advocates from a prosecutorial perspective on these things. So what they wanted to clear up was that as physicians, we don't diagnose shaking. We diagnose abuse. Well, abuse is not a particular mechanism that can be tested. It's not a particular pathological finding that can be evaluated to a large extent. It's a state of mind that implies uh, <coughs> applied to a traumatic act. But they dumped shaking. Shaking it became abuse. And then the triad, remember the diagnostic criteria that had been deemed so specific and what justified using it for forensic purposes was the, was the triads. Those findings were considered to have such meaning. Uh, this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, 2015. This controversy regarding a triad is a straw man. The fact that they've been able to get a, a, away with this to some extent is really quite amazing since, like I mentioned, 100 doctors had signed that letter that was published around the country talking about the diagnostic specificity of the triad. The leading child of his text at the time talked about the triad having such impact. You said it was invented by defense experts. It was invented by defense That's experts. Right. That strategy, though, if you think about it, was brilliant. Get a whole bunch, of thousand people convicted with it, and then challenge it. So it wasn't really the best strategy of defense experts did. It. But in any event, um, but anyway, so they abandoned the triad. And then, as more and more cases of retinal hemorrhages, retinal hemorrhages had been—you uh, probably heard us refer to it more than we've talked about it. Retinal hemorrhages were the tiebreaker. So many of these cases, they would come in and say, yeah, you might be able to get a subdural hemorrhage from a shortfall, 
You do see brain swelling from a variety of things. But retinal hemorrhages are very, very specific for child abuse. Very, very specific for shaking. Well, over time, the literature started to catch up to that, and people started saying, well, we're seeing retinal hemorrhages in this, and this, and this, and this, and the mechanism for retinal hemorrhages, every time we try and test it, doesn't seem to work. And we can find this old literature where they gave, they uh, pumped up the intracranial pressure in primates, and that gave them retinal hemorrhages in adults. When they get retinal hemorrhages, we don't assume they suffered abuse. That really started to crater, and that, in some ways, was the most dangerous threat to all of us. And so the... Teaching has evolved to severe retinal hemorrhages. The retinal hemorrhages with particular characteristics are what are so indicative of shaking. And this is what shaking baby syndrome is as of today. Now, the thing that is perhaps most impactful with judges and juries is the is testimony that, look, we don't settle on a SBS slash AHT diagnosis until we've exhaustively ruled out all other potential causes. And that has a lot of, I think, common sense impact on people listening. Oh, you're only diagnosing this after you've ruled out everything else. It's just a matter of academic interest that other things might cause us if the child didn't have those things. The problem is, the shaken baby syndrome dogma affects when you will accept any of those other alternative explanations. The child may have thrombosed veins, meaning clotted veins, which would be consistent with the stroke, but if shaken baby syndrome dogma is that, that thrombosed veins will not lead to a subdural hematoma, then you won't, you won't diagnose venous thrombosis. You'll say that the veins are thrombosed from some sort of trauma, right? You say that the child uh, might have had subdural hemorrhage since birth, but if you accept shaken baby syndrome dogma that all such subdural hemorrhage will resolve within a month, then if the child is two months old, you won't accept. So there is no way to rule out most of these other causes, even assuming you do a very fulsome workup, which is not always possible and not always done. You can't do it without resolving the various shaken baby syndrome. Any statement that everything else was ruled out can only be offered based on a certain amount of assumptions that in and of themselves are quite controversial. But this is the one that sort of seems to make judges and jurors feel better. We ruled everything else. Now, of course, you all know, you know, the lawyers know, that the burden of proof still requires that you prove the one that's left over, right? You still have to prove the abuse. You have to rule in the abuse. And that's simply not done in many of these child abuse cases. You start with abuse and see if the defense attorney and their family can find a way to disprove it. Right? Often impossible to do. You know, in some cases, you can only prove it through an uh, autopsy. And if the child didn't pass, then there's no autopsy. Some, case, some things you can only prove if they're circulating blood and plasma. And that can't happen if you don't look, at, look, look into them until after the child is has passed, some things aren't provable. You know, old blood, what we call old or chronic blood, is found in many of these cases indicating that there was blood where it's not normally supposed to be going back weeks or months. How are we supposed to know what caused this old blood? But was it prior abuse? Did it traceable from birth? Was it one of these other conditions? The category of undetermined medically should be huge in these particular cases should be a big category, a meaningfully big category. But it's not. We treat it as binary, abuse or not abuse. And too often it's left to parents and public defenders and private attorneys and, and uh, doctors who are retained to help. Well, you come up with a strategy. You, I mean, you come up with an alternative. And then that alternative gets put on trial, even though nobody's really saying they know for sure what would have what caused it. But that's just the reaction to the challenges. These have become ubiquitous talking points. They are reinforced at conferences. They are present in statements from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, these are very specific in some extent. Um, some extent, they have proven effective, even though they should. The other thing that's been done, the science is all headed in one direction. 
science is all headed in one direction. On every one of these tenets, the science has really undermined classic shaken bit system on biomechanics, on the neuro, neuropathology, uh, on the ophthalmological issues, all of that the science is headed in one direction. The evidence base is a total mess. So the focus of childhood pediatrics today is putting out statements that bear the names of respected institutions to say, don't worry about what you're hearing. All the people that matter agree. And the most prominent of those is something called the consensus statement on abuse of head trauma in infants and young children. This is a statement that's now been signed on by child abuse uh, committees of many major, major medical organizations. Um, there's been a lot of uh, attempts to publicize, for example, this is just one example, but it's a prominent one, this consensus statement. Remember, I understand under Fry and Dauber there's different standards, but under either standard, whether or not a belief or understanding is generally accepted, plays heavily in the admissibility analysis. This is all designed for the courts. They're not trying to convince doctors who disagree with them. This is all to reassure the courts that these beliefs remain generally accepted. Forget whether they're right or wrong. Forget whether they can be validated. Forget the use they're being used for in a legal setting. They remain generally accepted within the medical communities. Look at this list of organizations that have signed on, and therefore that should truncate your analysis. Um, and it's been to some degree effective, although I think it's going to prove to be an awful idea. Um, the, real, the debate about this has gone on in the medical community, the scientific community, and the legal community. I've given up any real hope that it's going to be resolved in the medical community, or it should be resolved. It's not going to be resolved in the medical community, at least not anytime soon or until there's some impetus for it to be in the medical community. Um, it's not going to be involved in the scientific com community. Um, the scientific community is simply not cohesive enough to do anything objective about this. In other words, they have the same uh, influences that will keep the scientific community from taking a stand on this. If it's to get resolved, the force is going to have to come from the courts. It's going to have to come from the courts where courts start saying, we don't accept the, the reliability of any of these beliefs. And I think we're closer to that happening than some other people. But that's where it's going to happen. So what time we got? We got why don't we take a break for lunch and then we'll come back?